Welcome to Puto Politics, the political podcast of the San Antonio Express News. My name is Gilbert Garcia, Metro columnist, and I'm joined by Kerry Clack, columnist, editorial board. Uh, Metro editor, Greg Jefferson. Deputy editorial board editor, Nancy Prayer Johnson. And we've got uh, a lot of stuff to talk about this week. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about an, an NISD uh, school board candidate and her connection to the January 6th insurrection. Um, we're going to talk about a, a, a recently released report from a Texas uh, teacher vacancy uh, task force uh, that Nancy wrote about over the weekend. Um, but I wanted to start by talking about uh, something that uh, was uh, addressed in, in a recent city council meeting uh, in, in mid-February. Um, and, and this uh, is dealing with an issue that when, whenever we talk about San Antonio's economic uh, challenges, uh, the San Antonio International Airport always comes up as something that's kind of held the city back. Um, there have been a lot of ideas about uh, over the years about what to do about it. I think Henry Cisneros years ago was talking about uh, uh, encouraging the city to acquire some land because uh, you know the, this. The, the idea uh, uh, was that the existing uh, airport was to, was landlocked, too limited. That you couldn't do much with it, and that we needed to to look elsewhere. Uh, there have been a lot of ideas. But um, last month, uh, the city council was, uh, was shown uh, the first renderings of, of a plan to expand the airport. There's going to be a new um, a terminal C. This is a $2.5 million expansion. Greg, you've, you've written a lot about... Uh, Mostly uh, about how ugly and small the, air, the existing airport <laughs> yeah, is. Right. So, yeah, but, um, yeah, so, so it's interesting to see these new plans. Anyway, go ahead. Well, so, <laughs> you know, I mean, you've, you've, you know, you've edited the business section, and the airport comes up a lot. A ton, yeah. What, what do you make of, uh, of this plan? Uh, it's I I think it's a really interesting plan and the the renderings which we saw for the first time about a month ago yeah they're they're there it's nice spacious for those a lot of you watching of, on YouTube yeah a lot of lights uh, outside you've got uh, landscaping with with a lot of native grasses some nice trees uh, it looks great um, and the what, I think what you're looking at that that first one was uh, the plan terminal C. So this is the big uh, ticket item for this 2.5 billion dollar expansion. And by the way, this is not like when we say 2.5 billion, this is over a period of about 20 years. But uh, the expense is really front end loaded. Um, the most expensive item is going to be the construction of this terminal C. It's going to be over uh, 830,000 square feet, which is just, you know, for some perspective, you could fit the two existing terminals, A and B, into Terminal C. So this is a big deal. I, I, I would stop short of saying it's an exciting plan, but it's, it's, it's a really pretty solid plan, I think. I mean, and, and this, by the way, this is, I mean, we always talk about the airport in terms of uh, where we are as a city in, in the economy. I mean, is it is it uh, hurting uh, San Antonio business? I There is something, some small uh, part of that, that that's true, but I, my, my, my perspective has always been that uh, the airport is what it is because the business community, the corporate mm -hmm. citizenship of San Antonio, didn't wasn't to a point where it demanded more. Like if if you had, you know, several Fortune 500 companies, more than what you have now, more than three, uh, you would probably have more modern, larger, uh, more efficient airport facilities. I think yeah. it's it's kind of a reflection of where we are as a city and our economy. And it gets to that chicken of the egg thing. Right. Is, you know, are people staying away because of the exactly. airport and all that? I'm trying to remember. Uh, you would have a better idea about this, but when, like, when AT and T moved their corporate headquarters, was the that airport was, cited as that a, was? Uh, yeah, that was interesting. That was in, in 2008, and um, you know, when the news broke, the first thing we heard from AT and T was that okay, well, the reason was uh, the airport. Uh, the 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 very few numbers, uh, the very small number of direct flights from San Antonio International is very difficult for our uh, executives who were, you know, they traveled and still do it uh, internationally, right? So uh, it was kind of a hassle uh, getting out of San Antonio Airport. 
totally plausible. <laughs> I mean, no, <laughs> nobody would challenge them yeah. on that. But I mean, when it came down to it, um, you know, in the the new CEO of AT and addressed this with uh, a Dallas Chamber of Commerce about a year and a half ago. I wrote about this at the time, saying that. Yeah, that was one factor. There were many others, including um, the fact that you know San Antonio had a very fragmented business community. You've got you've got a handful of chambers of commerce. Nobody really spoke with one voice. That was as much as, from what I could tell, that was as much a part of it as the airport. I think really what it came down to, and what a lot of corporate relocations come down to, is Randall Stevenson, who was the uh, chairman and or CEO at the time in two thousand eight. Uh, would rather have been in Dallas than San Antonio, and that's really what it came down to. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they they went through the pretense of a relocation study, but even even uh, the exi- the the current CEO who actually ran that he you know he organized that study said we already know what the answer is going to be. We're going to we're going to move to Dallas, and they did. Yeah, interesting. Well, this this is kind of the product of a. Of a committee that uh, was was put together, probably, I think it was announced a little more than five years ago, um, and uh, it's I think the everything got slowed down because of COVID, and so uh, you know. But um, one of the things they had to look at, I mean, they, I think they looked at all the options, and, and they had to look at the, whether there was enough existing space um, to be able to create this expansion. And I guess they 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 determined that they could do it. They did. They did. And you know, part of um, you know, like I said, Terminal C is going to be – that's really the main project here. Just in, in, If you're just looking at costs, that's going to be the big one. Uh, but the the real Achille, Achilles heel, at least as far as uh, travelers go, uh, right now is Terminal A. It's It's got one of the sm- narrowest concourses in the country. It's um, it's uh, electrical system. Its plumbing system is pretty retrograde. They keep trying to patch it up. Um, the, and the plan is to uh, raise uh, or you know tear down at least a portion of Terminal A, but that's going to be years down the road. And so, w- when they talk about twenty twenty eight, is that going to be when Terminal C will be ready? Is yeah, that, okay. it'll it's it'll be open in second quarter of uh, two thousand twenty eight. Uh, before we move on to another topic, I mean, one of the things that that we've uh, ideas we've heard over the years, I don't think it, it was ever in the cards was the idea of like a regional airport with Austin. <laughs> yeah, uh, collaboration even with- that that was Henry Cisneros floated that idea. I believe it was in two thousand eighteen. Yeah, I mean, just to. Uh, Basically, talk. You know, he he was kind of uh, kind of preparing the ground for something like a DFW International, like a kind of a mega regional airport. Um, the problem with that was um, Austin Bergstrom Airport doesn't need. <laughs> I mean, from their standpoint, they've got they've got they've got a plan for how to accommodate growth at their airport. They didn't really see a need to cooperate with local, you know, with with San Antonio officials to create kind of this regional uh, airport. And would it have been a good idea? Maybe. But that would have been 20 years ago, the planning for this. It's not like Joe Cryer, a former, uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce guy and District 9 councilman, he had this thing, this line about, well, you can't go to a Walmart and just pick up an airport and then move it someplace. Takes a lot of planning. Uh, even Henry Cisneros has kind of he's dropped that idea, and it could be just because the political reality is it was just never going to happen. That was always a thing that always fascinated me over the years when people would talk about yeah. moving the airport to somewhere other part of town, maybe uh, on the south, well, south, 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 south side. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but just how it, just the logistics of it, right? And but but your comments yeah. about the, I mean, you, I mean, you echo what everyone, what hometown folks feel about. The airport, it's, it's you know, I mean, it's someone who grew up and remember uh, when it was just one terminal here, it was, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. We are world class city. We are world class well, city. It is, but you were world, and it feels like uh, the only, the only, uh, I keep comparing it to the Boise, Idaho airport. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just and kinda, I hate to say this, but it's just I mean, bland I'm, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, it, it actually reminds me of, and I hate to say this because I don't want to throw shade to my hometown, but I live near Corpus Christi and that's what it reminds me of. It reminds me of the Corpus Christi airport, yeah, yeah. which you would expect from a place like Corpus Christi. But, yeah. you know, we, recently we went to Colorado about a week ago and, you know, we come back in the Colorado, the Denver 
airport is beautiful, yeah, yeah. you know. I mean, it's it's a gorgeous airport, and I spend a little bit of time there. I've written before about the Houston airport. Mm-hmm. Um, I do really like Austin, you know, yeah. and we often use Austin. And um, this it's time we didn't. Too, right? It is <laughs> it is cheaper. There's usually direct flights. Mm-hmm. It's not that bad of a drive, um, especially when we were when we lived in Cibolo and it was closer. Um, but I mean this. I think that this holds promise. I mean, I'm excited about it. And when we got back this time and we, I mean, our flight arrived about 8.30, a little bit before 8.30, and we walk in and the place looks like deserted, like nothing is, <laughs> at all is open. And we were kind of hungry and yeah, thirsty I, I, and I, I, like, I everything's work. closed down. I mean, it looked like a ghost town. Yeah. It was embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. And it's not a good look, you yeah, know, and not. we're not welcoming people, tourists um, to to San Antonio in the best way it's possible. The first yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. That, and that's kind of the it's thing. Not it's a good like, story. Yeah, it's, it's our good. it's the front porch to the city. Yes. Yes. I will yes. say this though. I will say this. Like I've um I'm I'm really my uh, my middle daughter uh, lives in Seattle. So we've been traveling a lot over the last couple of years to Seattle. So I've been I've had a lot of exposure to SeaTac, the the regional airport. That place sucks. And the just trying to get through security, like everything is a hassle yeah. there. I will say at least it's made me appreciate how easy it is actually Efficient. to get through yeah, exactly, yeah. to get yeah. through San Antonio International. It's it's what nobody wants in San Antonio. It's it's kind of small. It's uh it's it's bland. It doesn't really flat, reflect our aspirations as a city. But man, you can get through through there you, pretty you quickly. Can. Yeah. <laughs> Can, can. I think one thing that the, the committee probably found is that one of the the limitations, you know, the fact that it is landlocked and it is uh, is you know the, the the result of the fact that it, it's fairly centrally located compared to some you know airports, you know, they're way out of town, and, and there is some benefit to that if you can work with what you have and try to like expand it and improve it. Um, you know, it's not that you, you get out of the airport, you're not that. It's not that long a drive to downtown or some other part of the city. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about the, the Austin situation, I mean, the, the way people have described it to me, the, the relationship we've had with Austin on the, on the airport issue – it almost sounds like when Harry met Sally or something, where like, like, like you could never, like when one, when one, when one person was into the other, the other wasn't interested, and then when the other was, you could never get both of them in, available yes. and interested at the same yeah, time. Yeah, you know? We should have yeah, a whole yeah. podcast just so, on Harry met yeah. Sally. Yeah. We'll, do that. We'll, we'll, we'll find a way to use that as to somehow to relate to poli- <laughs> every political issue. Um, wanted to move on to um, the uh, North Side uh, ISD. Um, School board race, and you got a candidate there, Amy Hoffman in District One, a first-time candidate, who um, was a Donald Trump supporter in 2020, and uh, she participated in a Trump train event here in San Antonio the week after the election, basically about a week after the uh, the race had been called for Joe Biden, and then she went to Washington D.C. on January 6th. She went to Trump's speech, um, and. Uh, again, for those of you watching on YouTube, you're seeing images of the peaceful the, gathering. Yeah, love, peaceful. love, Tourists. togetherness. Yeah. Tourists. 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 Kind of, it was a kind of a love yeah. happening. It was kind of a, kind of we kind of echoed San Francisco in the pictures of 60s. Gandhi and King and yeah. Jesus Christ. So, yeah, it you know. was it was uh, humanity at its finest. But um, yeah, so she she went to the Trump speech. Uh, she met like I think with some friends and relatives. They walked to the Capitol. She says she was there for just a few minutes. She had no cell cell phone service, and they decided it was cold and everything. They said, "Okay, well we've we've seen enough." And so they they left. She said she was kind of far away from the Capitol. Didn't see everything that happened. Didn't. It was even a while before she realized what had happened there. When after she got back to her hotel, um, so I this this was interesting to me um, because it. I think the when we look at what happened, I think it was one of the the darkest days in American history, one of the most uh, disgusting uh, events that we've seen happen in this in, in this country, uh, in our history. And I'm inclined to look at, at people who were who in, who were election deniers, who were who were there, even if they were not, even if they didn't try to breach the Capitol. The fact that they were there means that they they thought it was a worthwhile thing to uh, put some pressure. On Congress to maybe a little intimidation to try to block the certification. They, I mean, they were all there because they thought that the, the election results should not be certified. And I'm inclined to look and think this is disqualifying for someone who's who's running for office. Um, but you know, I, I can 
talking a little bit about about her and her her biography, and uh, you know, I, 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 I th- she she's apologetic. I don't think she's saying she regrets supporting Donald Trump, but she's saying that uh, you know she had never been to a political rally before. She's kind of described herself as sort of somewhat politically naive, um, and she got really stirred up about the election because she supported Trump and uh, and got caught up, as she said, in the frenzy. And she regrets going. Uh, so, Carrie, I'll start with you. I mean, when you look at this, do you think this is just this is just disqualifying? I was going to ask you, what do you what do you mean by disqualifying? Uh, excellent call, by the way. That they thank you. Paying all this out, but what do you mean by disqualifying? I mean, it, it, it's something that is is such a, a a black mark on somebody's record that you would just look and say, I don't, I just, I don't think that they should. Uh, th- this is not someone who's fit to serve. Uh, whether it's a school board or city council or anything, I, I, that this is this is something that that should, uh, regardless of what other what other uh, you know uh, qualifications they might have, that this is just it's it's just too big mm-hmm. an issue. I believe that, that I, and I believe that should that should come down to the voters. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't. <sighs> There's no indication that that she's in any of these photos that she took part. Right. Uh, yeah, you do wonder about anybody who's an election denier and mm-hmm. someone and an election denier being on a school board. But we or two things. First, we have to be careful about penalizing anyone because of of where they were at because they were at a yeah, a a. Great point. a uh, peace. Well, a, a, at the, what they thought may have been a peaceful right. uh, gathering, uh, you know, First Amendment, people to, to you know, to you know, freedom of assembly. Uh, and unless anything comes out that contradicts what mm-hmm. she says about leaving early, we also have to provide people, you know, some grace. Mm-hmm. I don't know if she's sincere in her um, apologies. I mean, it, <laughs> From your column, it does come across that maybe she is, but even if she's not, Mm -hmm. she didn't do anything illegally. She's putting her name up Mm -hmm. for vote, and ultimately it should come down to the voters deciding whether or not she should be disqualified. What do you think, Nancy? I mean, I don't think that there's no legal precedent, right, for disqualifying like this. So there's no way that she yeah, could and, and officially I, be disqualified. And I wouldn't suggest someone that, that may, someone should not be eligible to, to run. To run. It's, it's more about should should voters should look voters. at this as a disqualifying factor. Yeah. I mean, I know um, I wouldn't vote for her personally. Mm-hmm. I don't trust her. Um, I can appreciate what she told you in your column um, where you laid out, you know, that she didn't know what was going to happen that, you know, that day and everything. But there are other things I don't trust. Um, you know, the school voucher, how she says she opposes the school vouchers, but that doesn't fit, you know, that doesn't really fit with her narrative and, and where she stands. Um, I believe, you know, anybody who would have been there that day, probably is four school vouchers, um, is, is pretty strong chance. So to me, the biggest, the biggest, my biggest concern with this is that people don't pay attention to school board elections the way they should. They don't study the candidates and they don't know this background. So hopefully they subscribe to the San Antonio Express News. Hopefully they, they read your column and they know about this or listen to this podcast or all the above, right? But the, the reality is that a lot of voters, um, if people even vote, right, a lot of them don't even know who they're voting for, especially when it comes to student, I mean, I'm sorry, school board elections. And so what will happen is if you have somebody in there that just has these really radical views and, you know, whether it's left or right, right, um, if they're just really radical on either side, it's going to disrupt that school board. And right now, school boards need to be as strong as they can. There are so many issues that schools are facing. I mean, if you're looking at everywhere from teacher pay, I know we'll get there, get there yeah. to, um, you know, to banning books, right, to COVID. COVID, how they're dealing with COVID and everything else. You just don't want this kind of political, you know, extreme, just the severe rhetoric yeah. um, to to seep into there. Yeah, I mean, has she? Do we know? Has she disavowed uh, the reason she was there? the The view that the election was stolen from Do- Donald Trump. Yeah, she, she, has she, she moved off of that? Yeah, she said that she's accepted. Um, uh, she's accepted the results. She was, she, and you know, um, 
again, you know, she she describes her, herself as, uh, and I think it, 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 I was taken aback a little bit because I think we're we're so used to talking to people who have very strong we, people now are so uh, there's are so tribal in their politics and very entrenched in their views, and she's kind of describes herself as someone who. You know, really didn't pay close attention to politics. Like I, she, like I said, she she had never been to Washington D.C. before, according to her. She had never attended a political rally before this one. She said, you know, she's she's you know she's kind of really involved in the community, and she said she's worked with a lot of Democrats, and she's never. I think she said her, she voted for Bill Clinton uh, in the nineties. Um, she had was tired of the Clintons, didn't like uh, Hillary Clinton, and so she she said she cried after voting for Trump in twenty sixteen because she didn't like either candidate. Um, and but over the course of his administration, she uh, she came to feel like his economic policies. I'm, I'm assuming the, the tax cut and so on um, were were beneficial to the country and to her family. And so she became a supporter. And clearly, by the end of 2020, she had become a pretty, <laughs> yeah, pretty say, intense yeah. supporter. Yeah. Because that yeah. all sounds very linear yeah, and very, yeah. Yeah. very kind of one thing leads to another. Yes. And then you have this so, explosion in 2020, in, late in December. Let's go to January. Let's so, go to the, yeah. was this? So, I mean, it sounds it, it sounds like she described to, this to you as kind of her political awakening. Yeah. Truly, yeah. I mean, like yeah. it, after the election, between the election and January 6th. So, is her candidacy? Uh, for the school board, part of that political awakening. She that's not it. Not, not how she's described it. And, and uh, th- this is, I, I guess, I would say to people who are, you know, uh, most people are, are probably unfamiliar with her. And I, w- I was. Um, if you put aside this issue, and it's a very big <laughs> issue to put aside, but I mean, you know, she's someone. She's a, f- a fitness instructor. She's someone who's clearly. Because uh, I worry about this. This is the something you were you were talking about, Nancy. That there are people who sometimes run for public school boards who are really, if not hostile to public education, they're they're not supportive of it, or they have issues with it. Um, she's someone whose parents taught in NIST. She attended NIST. She has five kids going there. So she's so she's mm. this, she, there's a real there's a real belief in public education. She served in the PTA for I think 13, 14 years. Um, She's, uh, you know, she was on on a, a bond committee dealing with Parks and Rec uh, last year. Um, she's, you know, been like a, a involved with Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. She she has a, there are a lot of things. If you if you if you didn't know this one factor, you just say this is someone who's really involved in the community and seems to be able to work well with other people. Um, I do think she's sincere because she's. If you look on the voucher issue, I had concerns about that. I think if you look at the things that she's posting on her campaign uh, Facebook page, she's she's coming out really hard against vouchers. Um, and again, b- b- being that her own kids are in the public school system, I, I can I think it's genuine. But it, again, it kind of speaks to the fact that she was maybe not the conventional Trump supporter. Uh, she's not, uh, she does not describe herself as a real hardline partisan person. Um, she became a strong Trump supporter, but she I doesn't, I don't think she, I don't think she's somebody going to Republican party uh, you know, gatherings and, and most of the people at those gatherings probably would be supportive of vouchers. So, um, it's, it's, it, again, it, it, I was, thinking I would, about I would think that if she was truly in support for vouchers, given the climate, given where we are with, with Abbott and the legislature, I mean, it seems a way to go right now. Yeah. If you're, right. if you're a, a Republican candidate, yeah. I can, again, without knowing her mm-hmm. I, just from the column, if you told me to, to go one way or the other, I believe her. Yeah, and I don't. I, I don't. I do too. We all know folks who, even now, may still, maybe still think that the election was rigged. But we we know them as people, and we know and we can separate as, as difficult as it can be. We can separate what we know about them from what we consider to be a serious error in judgment when it comes to yep. supporting mm-hmm. the lie that. For the, me, what did it is in your column this quote. Um, and I guess she put it on Facebook with a collage of photos. And to me, that speaks because that was that's not looking back and trying to explain to you as a columnist. And she knows who you are and what you write. You're talking and, about where she claimed election fraud. And, yeah, the, and, so, she, and she posted that on the day of the on of the, the day of it. Right. Yeah. With photos. And she said hundreds of the, this from your column, mm-hmm. you know, that from her Facebook, right. hundreds of thousands of patriots showed up to protest election fraud. It's amazing um, with photos. Now, to me, that says a whole lot. That's all I need to hear. 
What, what, what time? Will the, what, what time? And I mean, is she going to say in well, the in her election? Is she going to say if she doesn't win? Is it, ooh election fraud? You know, I mean, it's just. I, 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 I want to be curious. I, I don't want to come off as so. Def- I just. I'd be curious about at what time were those. Were the, I, I haven't, I they they, they were taken at the speech that Trump gave that morning, and I think she probably posted them shortly. So after maybe that. before the yeah, before yeah. The yeah. this gets certainly before she was it's aware of it. Still pretty yeah. intense at that yeah. speech. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, it was. To me, uh, the interesting thing is her, like the truly interesting thing is like her decision to. Uh, leave after a few minutes like, oh, I, mean, yeah. like yeah, yeah, I mean grant it was cold it really scary yeah. Yeah, but presumably she took a winter jacket maybe a hat yeah. some yeah. gloves yeah. scarf maybe uh and it's entirely possible that there might have been another reason for her deciding di- deciding to leave maybe but t- are taking we sure about that, no we're not no no, no she we're says not. it we're, we're not, not yeah. sure yeah. Yeah. exactly yeah. when she left yeah, yeah. i just question that like yeah. it, it, it's i mean you know it put yourself in that that context you're at this, uh, you know, she didn't seem to be too cold when she posted the photos from the speech. Yeah. And then suddenly it's yeah. really chilly. I doubt if the I, I doubt if uh, a microstorm just came into the area. No, I can see her getting so. scared. I mean, just watching it on live on right. TV, I was like, I was scared for people there. Yeah. I mean, it's possible um, that, that her thought was I went and I, I heard him speak and that was what I, I came for. But I, but like, like yeah, I, I would think if you've made that, that trip, you'd maybe want to stay a little longer. It, so it still would be more telling if she had posted pictures that night of the, the pictures that we were just looking at. Yeah. If she had posted pictures that night yeah. and then was still. Carrie's totally right. Yeah. I think I, it's, I, that's, that's right. Yeah. It's kind of the timeline for the that timeline. Day. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I think one of the things that's been that was instructive to me uh, uh, with this is that there are, and, and, and Carrie, you were this is you were kind of, uh, talking about this uh, a minute ago that there uh, there are many many people who bought into the election fraud lie, and they 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 come from a lot of different angles. Uh, some of them. Um, are just, you know, hardcore ideologues. And there's some people who are maybe less politically engaged, but got, got caught up in this. And I, I think it's, um, you know, I, I, putting aside whether she deserves to be elected or not, I think it, it was, it was instructive me because I, 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 I've just, I just think that, as I mentioned before, January 6th was such a horrible event. And, and I think that the, the big lie about the election has been so toxic to our political system. But I have to re- remember that there are some individuals who bought into it who, um, you know, I, I, they weren't victims, but they were, they were, they were, they were manipulated. Yeah. And they, um, I mean, I think, I guess if you, if you want to sort of try to, to bring some sanity to back to our political system, is it, is it better to say, you're horrible, and and we don't want to have anything to do with you. Or, okay, you've 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 kind of seen, you kind of come to your senses on this, and 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 we're willing to, to 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 uh, to have a dialogue with you. I mean, I guess you know, I'm, I'm inclined to think that it's maybe healthier to do the, the the latter, as long as someone is is open to conceding that maybe they made a mistake. Yeah. And you know, and and. <laughs> Should she get elected, she's going to have a spotlight on her, unlike anybody else locally on the school board. People just paying attention to, you know, to what she. I just get the sense that she really is about that. This again, yeah. I defend you. I don't know the know the lady, yeah. but uh, this was a, a bad decision, an aberration on her part, and that she, that she really is concerned about education and her children's education. Yeah. I wonder who's backing her, which PAC is backing her, if she's or she has any group, you know, that's funding her election. I guess we don't know that yet, yeah. but I mean that is a trend, right, with the school board's um, elections is that these PACs go and, and fund the candidates and some are just extreme, very extreme. So that's what I also have in the back of my mind too, yeah. um, is thinking about that and, and the repercussions for the school board that that can have. I, um, you were talking a little bit uh, a few minutes ago, Nancy, about uh, about the challenges that the, the schools are facing. So I wanted to to wrap things up with uh, something you wrote about this this past weekend, which was uh, a report from the the Texas uh, Teacher Vacancy Task Force, which I guess has been working for about the past year um, on on the issue of teacher retention. I guess that's 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 the main because I mean this is a, 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 a major problem that we have in the state right now. What 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 stood out to you from that report? 
I mean, there wasn't any breaking news in there. I was glad they finally finished, and we knew that that would happen after after the election, right? That it would take that long. Um, you know, the biggest um, the biggest focus was on compensation, and so you have this task force of teachers, and and it was teachers and administrators, and that's one thing that's super important. Is at the very beginning there were only um, two teachers mm-hmm. on that task force, <laughs> and so teachers know better. And I wrote about that back then it's like hello this is a teacher task force and there are two Mm -hmm. and everybody else are superintendents administrators and things like that um and so then they added so it was an equal number of teachers and administrators from across texas so they did better on that and so finally this this report comes out and there's no breaking news in there right there's no huge bombshells but they did focus on compensation and so i mean you just think about any job you know you want to get paid what you know, something that's worth your value and and worth your work. Um, And that's just very basic, right? Um, So, you know, it starts Mm $33,000, about $33,000 for the minimum salary, and then it goes up to $54,000 after 20 years. That struck me. That in your column, that really struck me. Now, I'll tell you what. I was a teacher not that long ago. (laughs) I've been here two years, and right before that, I was a teacher. And um, that's a long time to wait for. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. And yes. Now, where I worked, and it's it's important to say that where I worked, you know, I started at fifty four thousand, my very first teaching job, and I taught for about thirteen years. And so, um, you know, it's not that low everywhere, but that is a minimum salary in Texas, and it's just you know the, these teachers are not not valued, and they you know it shows, and they they're asked more and more. And and more. And so you have teachers who are working and the, some teachers were quoted in the report. So I thought that was a nice touch they, that they did. They use quotes, direct quotes from different teachers from different places. Right. And so um, they quoted teachers talking about how they work days, nights, weekends. Um, and then they also have to get second and third jobs. Sometimes their health care um, is ridiculous. Um, I have personally known, like, so school systems contribute on average $330 an average per month. Um, and if you compare that to other industries statewide, $827 per month is what others contribute. Um, I have known teachers who most of their paycheck goes to health care. And I mean, you think about the amount of work they're doing and all that money going to health care. So they cannot afford, you know, their basic necessities and their families, you know, what they need. And so you wonder, why are the, is this max, mass exodus of teachers? They're not getting paid and they're not getting valued. Now, there is some hope, though. And, you know, and that's how I kind of summed it up. And my column is like, you know, Abbott, um, he had this you know press release about this report. And so he's talking about it. And then he says, you know, that teachers are play a pivotal role. Yes, they do. So he understands. I mean, nobody can can dispute that. Um, And then he says that they are going to look at practical policies for the state. And so, I mean, I'm hopeful, but number one practical policy would be stop pushing these charters, um, the voucher program. I'm sorry, not charters, um, the voucher program, because that's going to take money from schools. So how how are schools going to be able to pay teachers more and retain and recruit new teachers and train them and then do all these other things? So it wasn't just compensation, but it was also support and then workplace conditions. And all that takes money. When we talk about workplace conditions, is the the sort of recent um, war from some Republican lawmakers on, you know, uh, the – what they allege is CRT, uh, critical race theory being taught in schools and wokeism and all. Basically, this this battle, which I I think we could d- devote a whole episode to that. But a lot of this is is sort of uh, just sort of being whipped up in the imaginations of, of these lawmakers, in my opinion. But um, but is that sort of war against uh, where teachers feel like they're 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 being scrutinized on on, on how they discuss uh, you know current events on. Uh, what books are available in, in libraries? Do you think this is playing a part in in uh, the difficulty That's when a great it comes to retaining question. teachers? That's a great question. Um, I didn't see that in the report. Yeah. I did not see a mention of it, but that has to be, um, I mean, that has to play a role, right, in how they feel um, underappreciated, undervalued. Um, I mean, they're not trusted to teach, um, you know, 
to teach things as they see it or as needed. Um, and they're just put into these little boxes, right? And, and they're just used as political fodder. Like they're just, and it's, it's ridiculous. And so I, I mean, I think especially teachers who really pay attention. There are some teachers who are just so busy that they don't pay attention to politics. I mean, I'm be real honest. Like they don't, they don't read it. They don't, they stay out of it. They don't look at the social media stuff. Um, and they put their head down and they just work. You know, and so maybe we have some of those and who just, you know, simply follow the teaks and, you know, which are the state, you know, the state um, requirements that you teach the students. Um, so it's possible that, you know, for some of them, some teachers may say, no, it's, it doesn't matter. But I think it matters. Yeah. And for, well, for a lot of subjects, I mean, if you teach math or you're teaching science, I mean, it's, these kind of issues aren't, aren't probably affecting your 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 lives or your or yeah. your, your work experience. It, it, it's probably for particular people in, in, in particular subjects. Yeah, a lot of it is is the working, the hours, like, you know, they're salaried. So it doesn't matter how much you work. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you get paid the same amount. Um, and then more and more is required of you. So much paperwork, um, you know, during COVID was ridiculous. With just taking attendance was, I and mean, we had flow charts. And it changed, like, it felt like every day how to take attendance, <laughs> and you never got it right. And so, and attendance is really important, and that's why that's why it was changing every day, and that's why you had flow charts, was because that's how they get paid, is for school daily attendance. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens. I think, you know, obviously there's a huge surplus in, you know, our state has a huge surplus right now. And, of course, everybody wants a piece of that, but schools absolutely need um, some support, um, because without teachers, they can't do anything, you know? Well, uh, I think on that note, we'll wrap things up. I uh, hope everyone's doing well. We'll be back with you next week. We've got a lot of, uh, stuff happening on, in the, on the, uh, San Antonio election front. And we'll be, we'll be discussing some, some of that in the, in the coming episodes. Take care. Mm-hmm.